Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the online piano and violin tutor. If the violin is shaking when you're trying to do vibrato, that is the number one sign that you are attempting vibrato too soon. Number one, the first thing you're gonna need is a violin. I have been playing the violin since I was four years old. I went to university and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in music. With the amazing talent that's Alison Sparrow. Alison, come out here. So bear with me if there are any technical hitches, I'm sure it'll be fine. For about five years, I was an examiner for the London College of Music. And over the years, I've seen basically the music world from every kind of possible view, really. And because of that, it has enabled me to write my own violin course. Hello, everyone, about the world. So, there we go, that's kind of all you really know, need to know. And don't forget guys, anyone can learn to play the violin. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the Online Piano and, and the Online Violin Tutor. I hope everybody is doing well and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, as usual, um, quick housekeeping announcement, my 1 to 30 violin books, in case any of you are new here, welcome to my channel. I have a 1 to 30 violin course, which is an online course, which takes you from a complete beginner to a very decent, accomplished, intermediate player, 59.99 US dollars, 100% downloadable, all the links are going to be down in the description underneath. Let me put you back onto the main screen. Okay. Um, hi, Amy. Nice to see you, Chris. Um, Kersey, Blue Row 77, Tracy, um, Kevmuth. Hello. Nice to see you all. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you all had a good uh, new year and all of that jazz. Let's kick it off with, um, with a rosin question that I had from last week. And somebody wanted to know how much you was in your bow. The question came up last week, um, somebody wanted to know if they've got a new rosin, uh, how do they clean the old rosin or the previous rosin off the bow? And you can, and I do have a video on this, and you can do a deep clean on the bow, but I don't really recommend you do a deep clean unless you really, 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 really have to, because lots of things can go wrong when you do that. You're using, um, you're using uh, I think it is denatured alcohol that you're using to clean the bow with, and that's just going to dry out the hairs. The hairs are synthetic. So imagine if you had hair extensions, the, lady will know, the ladies will know this, or fake hair. It's not like natural hair. It, it just goes dry. So the more you kind of put heat on it and straighteners and that kind of thing, the hair will just go dry. So real hair has natural oils coming down. Uh, any other kind of synthetic fake or uh, horse hair that's been used on a bow is going to dry out. So we don't, we don't really want to be doing deep cleaning it if we can possibly help it so all you need to do is just to make sure that you just play the old rosin off before you attempt to put the new rosin on now when it comes to rosining the bow I do have a separate I, I have quite a few videos of these on my channel uh, but to quickly recap what I do is uh, and before I do that let me just show you the rosin because someone's gonna scream out to me and ask the rosin I use is this one uh, can you see that there? Let me put my hand behind it. So this is Sartori rosin. Oh, actually, there you go. You can see that now. So this is Sartori rosin. This is light rosin, and this is the one I use. It is quite expensive as far as rosins go, but when you think of, I mean, I've had this rosin a, re a really long time. I've got two of these. I have one, one in my main case for this for my main violin, and I have one in my electric violin case as well, just, just because I can't be bothered to keep swapping them in and out in and out when I'm going to gigs and things. So all I do was when I'm rosining the bow and I probably rosin the bow once every two weeks, something like that. So, I mean, it depends how often I'm playing. It depends. I mean, if I'm playing every single day, I don't always play every single day these days, depending on what I'm doing. But if I'm not playing every single day, then probably once every two weeks, if I am playing every single day uh, for quite long periods of time, couple of hours, that kind of thing, I'd probably be rosining it once a week. But you don't need to rosin your bow quite as much as you think you do, actually. So what all? So all I do when I rosin the bow is exactly this. So I will just focus on the end of the bow, going right to the end because this little bit here is the part that gets filthy so I'm doing this in real time so this this I'm due a rosin so it's it's come at a good time so I just do a little bit of rosin down the end 
And when I'm doing it, a little tip, I kind of just tilt the bow as well. I don't just always do it flat. I'm kind of just tilting the bow a little bit to make sure I sort of get the bits on, on the side, if that sort of makes sense. So obviously I'm doing it flat, but I'm tilting it a little bit just to make sure that all of the hair is kind of covered as much as possible. Then I will just do exactly the same thing at the top. It is a bit harder to do it at the top because you've got the, you're pushing down on the weight of the bow. But I'm just doing a bit up here. I go all the way to the very top again. I'm just kind of tilting it. And then I'll do maybe, I don't know, a good half a dozen swipes up and down the bow. Just helps to blend that in and it just saturates the middle of the bow. I don't know how many swipes that was, but that that's literally it. That makes me, I'm... That makes me happy to do that. I've probably even put a little bit too much rosin on there because I was just chatting to you. So that's all I do for rosining the bow. You don't need to sit there and do it too much, but um, this this is all I do. And like I said, I've put annoyingly I've probably done a few extra stripe, a few extra swipes, not stripes, than what I would normally do. So um, Estrella's twenty four. No, don't rosin your bow every single time you play it. Just there's just. I mean, nothing will happen. Nobody will die. Your violin won't break. Nothing like that. But you just don't want to be doing that. What you'll find, it's actually counter, it's actually counterproductive to do that because what you'll find is that your bow will just have a build, a constant build up of rosin, and not only that, your violin will have a constant build up of rosin as well. So your violin will have so much rosin down here. Your strings will have a, a horrible build up of rosin. And yes, you can clean it each time you play it. But unless you're kind of using sort of, you know, string cleaner, don't don't use anything wet on here, by the way, just a dry uh, or like one of those yellow dusters or something like that just to uh, wipe it off. Make sure you keep this clean as well, because when uh, the rosin will start off being white, initially and then as it hits with the moisture the, the natural moisture that's in the air what will happen is it the white will then change and it will sort of go like a you know sometimes when you have glue and glue is white and you put the glue on and you know when the glue is tacky or you know when the glue is ready when the glue goes clear so it's it's kind of obviously rosin isn't glue but it's kind of does the same thing so you won't see it white anymore you'll just think oh the rosin's gone but actually the moisture in the air has kind of a, a sucked up with the rosin um, a little bit like you know talcum powder and water or flour and water sucked up the rosin and then it just kind of cakes on here and you don't really see it and then you get a very small kind of build up there that can kind of end up muffling the sound over time so you don't really want any of that you don't want any of the gunk all over your strings and you'll find that your sound will become scratchy so I think some people kind of say that their their playing is very scratchy and you know, it's one of those things that I don't even think about. I kind of initially think, oh, you know, well, it's your bow, it's the way you're playing. But actually, I don't realise that it could be, it could be something that, uh, as, as, as basic as, as Estrella said, um, I thought you had to rosin it every time you play or practice. So if people are doing that and they're sounding really scratchy, then that could be a main factor as to why you're sounding really scratchy. So if you are playing every single day, um, for quite a good while, I would say you you might need to, to rosin your bow weekly or maybe once every week and a half, something like that. If you're sort of just playing, I don't know, um, more recreationally, less than once a day, then maybe once a fortnight or, you know, just once every so often when you kind of feel it. But definitely not too much. Okay. So let's go back up to the top. Now, Amy, um, Amy June, hello. She had a question. Um, I'm just wondering, I bought a set of Parastro Tonicas. They're good strings. I tried putting them on, but the ball end, which I assume you mean there, doesn't want to fit in the tail piece. Um, the wrapping on the string is too thick. So um, actually, I it, it depends on your depends on your fine tuners that you've got here and I'm assuming that by that you have the same fine tuner that I have um let me see uh, there we go so if you look at oh, I've got hands all in the way if you look at my tuner there can you see you can see where the ball is at the end there and you can see the tuner is is kind of is kind of like that and then the ball is just the ball is fitting into that kind of tuner. So what you might find is that your, oh, where we are, your tuner, uh, let me see if I can show it to you there. 
sorry, the camera is the wrong way around, <laughs> if you're wondering why I can't seem to get this right. So the tuner is there. So all you need to do is just, just separate those apart a little bit. So get yourself some, and be very, very careful with this. Um, I can't stress this enough, but get yourself some, some, like some, some needle nose pliers, and you just want to kind of you want to just tease it apart a little bit. So I know what the problem is. So there's sometimes the wrapping, you get the ball at the very end, and sometimes the wrapping that goes round it, whatever color, I, I, uh, red I think they are with Prastro Top, whatever color they are, sometimes they wind it a bit too thick. And then you try and put it in, you try and put it in the, uh, in, in the, in the fine tuner but they're just they're just a little bit too close together so all you need to do is just get some needle nose pliers and just sort of you just want to gently kind of pull them apart a little bit not too much but just a little bit and then you'll find it'll just slot in nicely and and it won't be a problem so that's it that's all you need to do you don't need to go out and buy any new tuners it's just you know just 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 get get some needle nose pliers or something or maybe someone can help you but just obviously just be very careful um right what else have we got um, SSB73Q. If just playing the violin for personal use, what do you think about learning the violin by ear? Um, I don't sort of see the point in doing that really. I think, um, and there's nothing wrong with playing by ear. Hear me out here. <laughs> I think when you play by ear, you're very, you're very, 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 very limited you are never going to be able to play any of the pieces you want it will be like the kind of thing where say you and your friend start playing the violin at the same time and your friend is learning from a teacher or my course for example or something like that and you're both starting at the same time and you're both starting out at the same place so let's say you both know nothing about the violin or you know a little bit about music but you both know exactly the same amount let's just say and whilst your friend is starting my course and they're going off and away and, you know, they're, they're not sounding very good, you know, they're playing very basic stuff and you're kind of learning by ear and you're playing Jingle Bells and Happy Birthday and all these other kind of tunes. However, you'll get to a point where you will start off being initially better than your friend as your friend is here and then your friend will start getting better and better and learning more and more and more while you're still here doing exactly the same stuff as you were because you can't move. Your friend is, is learning more and more and more and getting better and better and better and going up and up and up. And you're not going anywhere because you can't, because you're not learning, because you're learning by ear. So when you're learning by ear, you're restricted with what you know. You can't learn what you don't know. But that is the whole point of learning, isn't it? You're learning from a, a course or from a teacher or whatever it is that you're learning from. You are learning you're learning the whole scope of the violin. My course will take you to a, a kind of intermediate level, admittedly, and that is as high as you can go with online teaching. Other than that, it then becomes slightly more expressive and personal. And that's kind of where you might need someone like a coach or someone to kind of help you out there. So I can't actually write a book to teach you any higher than that. So intermediate is about as high as you can go. However, when you're an intermediate player, your friend would then be able to play whatever piece of music they wanted to. So they'd just be able to pick anything up and play it. You won't be able to do that because you'll be limited in your knowledge. You'll be limited in your skill, grossly limited in your skill. And you'll only be able to play the songs that you know. So your mate's playing a song and he's like, oh, do you, do you want to play along with me? Um, I don't know that song. Can't do it. Because you can't read music. Whereas you could take the music away. You say, yeah, fine. Give me the music. Take the music away. And you could learn it. So playing by ear, I mean, it depends sort of what you want to do. But I just think, I don't think you're going to find any gratification from that. Because it's just going to be so limited. So you're probably going to get really bored, really frustrated. And no fun. The whole fun in learning the violin is overcoming a challenge. And starting off really rubbish to start with. And seeing yourself improve. You know, a little bit like weight loss, isn't it? You start off much bigger than you want to be and then you as you're losing weight you're spurred on by the fact that you're losing weight and you can see yourself getting fitter and slimmer and healthier so i just think even if it's for personal reasons i just don't i i just think it's just very limiting but if you if it's something you still want to do then obviously you know each each to their own um have we got any more questions right give me a second just to read a uh, few hellos hello ben um, Cara, hello from Colorado. Amy, yes, I hope that's answered your question. Um, Mwali Educate says, 
how do I start learning vibrato? I find it so difficult. Um, the best thing for me to say is I have three vibrato videos. I'll link them directly underneath this, um, this video for you. And I will remember to do that this time. Um, vibrato, um, maybe I could just break that down in just to a few in into a few seconds in this video. I don't want to go into doing vibrato because I've done loads of videos in, in, I've done loads of videos on vibrato. Um, and they're quite, um, they're quite big videos, but, uh, in a nutshell, vibrato is something that you want to be starting when you have been playing for at least a year. So you want to have learned the basics and you want the basics to be down. You know, you, you want to be, you want to know those basics. So it isn't just a case of, um, you know, oh, I, I, I know the four strings and, and I can read them on the music, um, and that kind of thing. It's, Un knowing the basics and understanding the basics is very different to nailing the basics and, and really kind of really knowing and have that deep understanding of them. And it's like with anything that you start off new, you don't know what you're doing, then you try it and it's kind of, you know, it's not very good. And then you start getting, start getting into the swing of things. Then you start kind of getting quite good at it. That's fine. And then a year down the line, you're actually mastering it. So there's a very, di very big difference between just getting the basics and really mastering the basics you want to be at a point where you've done that and the it's it's no more of an issue for you so once you've got to that point the next thing you want to do is just decide whether you're going to be doing arm or wrist vibrato so it should be noted that i only teach wrist vibrato because of the way i hold the violin so in a nutshell if you're holding the violin with the thumb here you're going to be doing wrist vibrato so if the thumb is held like that that's wrist if you are someone that holds your violin, oh, I hope that didn't come out too loud. If you're someone that holds the violin more in here like this and you're holding more that way, if that kind of makes sense, then you are going to be doing arm vibrato. So I don't do arm vibrato because that's just not how I hold the violin. Both of them are absolutely fine. It doesn't matter. Um, neither are wrong or right. They're both justifiable and they both sound just as good and you'd never know whether someone was doing wrist vibrato or arm vibrato so once you've decided that if you are doing wrist vibrato like me that's great if you're doing arm if you've decided that you're doing arm vibrato because of the way you hold the violin with your thumb more uh, higher up then you'll need to go and find a video that teaches um, arm vibrato because I you know I don't do that uh, and then when you, if you're doing wrist vibrato, then basically the, the, the basic movement is going to be rocking from one side of the fingernail to the other. And that's kind of it really. You're just rocking that way. Just rocking the finger from one side of the fingernail to the other. And then you do that on all the fingers and then your thumb, oh, it's going this way. And then your thumb is going to be holding your thumb there is going to be holding the neck stable as you're rocking. But as you can see, I'm doing that. Let me tilt you around this way. I'm just doing wrist vibrato because the movement is just coming from here because I'm rolling from one side of the fingernail to the other. So that is a very, uh, a very short uh, whistle stop tour of vibrato. I hope that has kind of um, it, it isn't full on vibrato, uh, but I'll link them underneath this video. So ch check back in an hour or so. And I will put those links there to the three vibrato videos that I've done over the years. Hello, Sue. Um, Mwali again, what is the key to perfect bowing without touching other strings? Um, so I briefly talked about this last week as well. It's just about the level of the arm. You've just got to get the arm level correct. So if you want to be playing the A string, your arm is going to be there. D string. Oh, I've done it again with the, with the microphone. Hope I've not blown all your ear drums out. So if you want to play the A or the E string, your arm is there, A, D, and G. So it's just about getting the level of your, your arm right here and then keeping that bow consistent as well and not having that bow kind of move around. So practice long bow strokes, but that's really the main way that you're going to isolate any of the strings. The other reason could be that if you don't have a, uh, a bridge, that is tilted enough. If not, then you will have to uh, have someone sort that out for your violin luthier who can alter the uh, alter the tilt of the bridge. Um, okay, what another question? Alasse, I think I've pronounced that right. Is forty five minutes a reasonable amount of time to spend pra practicing every day as an early intermediate? 
Um, no. <laughs> um, okay, it depends. It depends on what you're playing with that. If you... I, 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 so I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're playing or what you're learning from. If you were, if you were my student or you were learning through my course, let's, let's just use that as just something to go by. Um, so if you were my student or you were learning online via my course, then you would probably have something like, you'd probably, I'd probably have you, uh, alternating between two or three pieces depending on the capacity of the student. So let's say I had a good student, um, someone with that was that was very capable, someone that was, you know, re really going for it. They'd probably have they'd probably have three pieces on the go. The other thing they would have is a whole bunch of scales and arpeggios, uh, technical work that they would be doing. And I'd be throwing as, as much of that as I possibly could. And they may even have something like a study piece of music, which is just a just like a, a, a glorified exercise if you like but they really drill down certain bowing techniques so rather than you practicing a technique and you're doing it all on the open strings it's just really boring it's just um it's a technique a way to practice a technique in the form of a little bit of a tune something like that just to kind of keep your interests up so yeah three pieces two or three pieces possibly a study um and then some scales and arpeggios. And if you were doing something like that, I mean, that would probably be taking you about an hour and a half. So 45 minutes at an intermediate level, I can only imagine that your the quantity uh, is not very much. I mean, if you're just playing one piece, then 45 minutes on one piece, maybe. But I still think 45 minutes is, is quite low. But as I said, it just it does just depend on, on what you're learning and what you've been set and all that kind of thing. Um, okay. Do I have any backing? Ben says, do I have any backing tracks for songbooks one and two? I don't have any backing tracks. Uh, songs book, but, oh my God, <laughs> let's get my words out. Song books one and two do not have any backing tracks to them. I didn't put any backing tracks to, the, to them for, uh, for a good reason. One, when you move on to songbook one, you'll have just finished the first 10 lessons and throwing in a backing track into the mix with that I just didn't think it was a very good idea having said that I do have Gypsy Firelight which is the piece uh that you do in lesson 10 so that does come with backing track that's more of a fun piece but songbook one doesn't songbook two doesn't either songbook three does because it is because it is a lot more challenging if you want to go ahead and find some pieces to play with backing tracks then absolutely do that it's good to play with backing tracks because it will help you play in time. So it's better than just playing with a metronome. Um, metronome's okay, but they're just kind of tick tock, tick tock. They're just really, really boring, aren't they? So playing with a metronome is no, no real different than playing to a piano or a piano backing track. The only difference is, is that the piano backing track just sounds a lot better. It sounds more of an ensemble. So at any time, really, you can start playing an ensemble would be better because that's going to help you with your rhythm. If you've got a backing track going in the background, you have to work with that backing track because once you press play and the piano is off and away, it isn't going to stop and wait for you. The same with a metronome. That's just going to keep on ticking. Only if you skip a beat or two with the metronome, it doesn't matter because it's just a relentless tick, 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 isn't it? But it's different when you're playing with a piano backing track because if you skip a few parts, it ain't going to go back for you. It's just going to keep on going. You're just going to have to kind of pick up with it. So anytime you can play with backing tracks or anything like that is always going to be uh, a good thing to do as a musician. Um, uh, SSB73Q, is there a big difference in violin sound between 1,000 and 10,000? Huge. It's just not going to be just the sound. It's going to be how you're playing it as well there's i mean a thousand dollars for a violin you would expect the violin to be nice so it'll be it won't be heavy it won't be clunky it'll have nice pegs it'll have nice strings a nice um it'll have ebony wood all over it so a nice ebony wood fingerboard and eb ebony wood is quite light wood as well some of the cheaper violins they will have um more like a tin type um tailpiece uh word escaped me then and the more expensive ones will have a, a much lighter kind of tailpiece and much lighter so everything about it will just be a lot better so it isn't just that 
a lot of them, a lot of the cheaper ones will be quite thick, uh, will have a quite thick uh, layer of the uh, the clear varnish that they use, whereas this is a little bit different than what they use on here, which is why it's not super shiny. So there'll be a huge difference in the kind of the feel of it as well, but generally, I mean, yeah, there'll be a there'll there'll be a, a humongous difference between the two. Um, okay, your course, Chris Holland, your course covers legato, spiccato, and staccato bowing. What other bowing techniques are useful to learn? Um, that's probably it. That all I can kind of uh, all I can kind of think of really. Those are the those are the kind of the main ones that you're going to be needing. The rest of it would depend on what kind of piece you're playing as to whether there's any call for it. So there might be something more like martelet bowing. Martelet bowing is just. Um, in fact, I think I do have um, off the top of my head. I do have some martelet. I do cover a little bit of martelet bowing in um, book tutorial book three lessons twenty six to thirty. But uh, twenty six to thirty. But martelet is just more. It's just more like that, really. It's just more of a. It's just more of a measured kind of bowing. Um, but I wouldn't say that martelet is particularly difficult. Spiccato is quite difficult and you really need to kind of incorporate that into a piece of music. But um, I would probably say that, um, yeah, that's th those, are, those are the main ones that, that you need that, that I think that you would need to know, which is why I've put them in the book. Anything else, you can probably just go away and discover. You, you'll, you'll By the time you need to do anything else or by the time you might need to move on and learn another uh, bowing technique that you're not familiar with, you'll have all the tools needed to kind of move on to do that anyway. Um, Nayak Neha, Neha, hope I've pronounced that uh, correctly. Which violin should I purchase? That's just a very uh, impossible question to answer specifically. All I can say is that um, I do already have in the links underneath um, some links to the Fiddler Man or Fiddler Shop violins that I've reviewed. It really depends on what your budget is. It really depends on what sound you're looking for. I've reviewed a lot of violins with different kind of budgets and I go through exactly what sound I think they are, um, who they'd be suitable for, this, that and the other basically my, my opinion based on the sound of them and I've actually compared a few of them so I really couldn't sit here and say you need that particular violin that's good for a beginner because you might not like it or that might not be in your budget or that one's too loud that one's too this that one's too that so I can only say go and have a look at the reviews um, and kind of just choose from there but there is no one there is no one violin that I can kind of recommend uh, let me just make sure I've not missed any um Satria, Satria, I picked up your violin four years ago, but I don't have much progress because I don't want to bother my neighbour with my scratchy violin. Is there any way to make the violin quieter? The only way that you can make the violin quieter is to use something like an ultra practice mute. Um one second. Wonder if I can just pull up a picture here so that you can see so here are some pictures of ultra practice mutes they're quite big ones <clears throat> excuse me so it's these ones there these ones here so these are ultra practice mutes now what these are going to do these are going to quite heavily mute your violin i'll show you the difference between that and a regular mute one second talk amongst yourselves for a minute No, it's not in my violin case. I must have put my mute away. Ah, there it is. Right, this is what I was looking for. So this is a regular mute. This one here. Just for clarification, because I know that some of you are going to be uh, trying to look for mutes and then you'll find this one and you might get a bit confused and then you might buy one of these as well because sometimes the sizing on the screen it will look massive but actually it's the size of like a uh, uh like like a wine gum isn't it so this is just a normal mute so this won't do anything so uh let me play it for you so you can hear what the difference is i don't have an ultra practice mute maybe i should maybe i should just get one and then i can show you so this is just without the mutes let me turn you down a little bit And then with the mute. 
So to me, that doesn't really sound any quieter. So if I had neighbors, it's still gonna bother them. They're still gonna be able to hear it. So what you need is an ultra practice mute. And what that will do is that will go all the way over. It's that they're about that big and they are designed to sit over the whole complete bridge. Now, what they will do is they will dampen the sound. So the ringing sound, that kind of resonating sound that you get from the strings, it will mute all of that. It will dampen that down straight away. It would be the equivalent of doing this. So you won't get any of that, uh, that, that resounding ringingness, but it will also help quieten them as well. That's the only thing that you can do. The other thing that you can do, I mean, that depends if you've got one of those violins and you just wanna spend um, a couple of quid or a couple of dollars, whatever it is, just buying an ultra practice mute. That's your cheapest way of doing it. The other way of doing it is um, by buying an electric violin. Now you can still hear electric violins, but they are very, uh, they are a lot quieter. However, they come with a caveat as well, because number one, you've got to buy an electric violin. So you're probably looking at another $200 minimum for an electric violin. Um, and then for that kind of price, they're not really that great. So they're going to be quite heavy they're going to be quite bulky and you've got to find one that you can actually put headphones a lot of them you can plug headphones in as well so you can hear the full aspect of the sound but nobody else will so they they kind of have their pros and cons so you'll have to buy one of those uh, an ultra practice mute is obviously going to be your your cheapest option but there are a couple of things but i think it is it is difficult if you are trying to make progress and the violin is a really loud instrument, but it depends on, you know, maybe just try and go to the furthest room in your flat or wherever, your apartment or whatever, your house, whatever it is that you are, so that you're furthest away from the neighbors, closing the door, that kind of thing. Ultra practice mute, see if that does the job. It'd be worth trying that first. And if the neighbors are not banging on the door <laughs> within 10 minutes, you'll have your answer. And if you still really, really want to do it and you're in a position to, then you know it might be worth looking into getting an electric violin. Make sure you have one, uh, make sure you find one that with the capacity of having headphones in, otherwise it will be no good. Um, and that's the only other option that you can, you know, just just kind of go, go, for, go, go from. Um, John, I bought a practice mute last month. It works great, five US dollars. Yeah, it's, yeah. So anybody that has an ultra practice mute, maybe you can, you know, let us know if uh, uh, how much it dampens the sound. But what I might do is I'll I'll get hold of one of them for next week's um, live, and then because this question comes up all the time, so then I can show you the difference. Um, and I've actually got. Um, down below, obviously you can't see it, but in my program, I can see how loud, how many decibels my microphone is. So I'll be able to see if it's taking down any of the decibels and you will be able to hear what the difference is and you know what, what it sounds like. Cause it's, it's always difficult to know when you never heard, you don't really know. So perhaps we can do a little experiment and a test with that next week. Um, a few more questions. Uh, I saw one from Ron. Hi Ron, how are you? First question, should I get a teacher after that? My plan is to go to an orchestra maybe in two years. And two, do you plan a kind of uh, masterclass uh, video of Frey? Um, once you finish the course, it's up to you if you want to get a teacher. It depends on how far you want to take your violin playing. I don't plan on doing anything else. I've I've thought long and hard about doing this over the years. I finished writing my, my 1 to 30 book course. So for anyone that's joined in, and not seeing this. This is my one to 30 book course. It takes you from a complete beginner to um, an, a decent accomplished intermediate player. And by that level, what I mean is that will take you to a level where you can go off and do whatever it is. So, you know, I like to, uh, as the, what, what is the saying goes, I like to teach a man how to fish, um, catch his own fish so that he can kind of support himself forever rather than kind of spoon feeding everything. So I teach you, uh, my teaching has always and always will be focusing on giving you the skill and you the knowledge. So you do everything yourself. I just sit back and just watch you do it all with guidance. You do everything so that you have all all the skill and all the knowledge and abundance to do whatever it is that you want after that. So my course will teach you everything you need to know about music. Then once you've got to that level, you then increase the difficulty level of the pieces of music. But when you do that, 
you will be able to decipher them and you will be slowly going up to that level to be able to play those more complicated pieces. But you'll know everything that there is. You'll know all the bowing, you'll you'll know all the notes, you'll know all the timing, you'll know the rhythms, you'll know everything there is to know. You'll just have to learn it and get better at it. Other than that, once you start work going into more challenging kind of music, you then start entering the field of interpretation. And that is probably where you need somebody to teach you that. But interpretation isn't um interpretation isn't um isn't like a blanket course i can't just make a course on how to interpret a piece of music because every piece of music is too individual so i couldn't say oh you need to play this piece that way and that way and that way because it's too specific on that piece of music so if i had a piece of music i'd say right so um if this was me i would need to play it this way that way um or why don't you try that passage a little bit more like this or why don't you try that passage a little bit more that way so I would bounce more off of you as a player, as well as what the composer wanted, um, what, uh, how we think we want to interpret that piece of music. So it's too, it's too specific. It's not generalized enough. So I can't, I can't bottle that up and put it in a book. If I could, I'd, I'd have found a way and I'd have done it, but, I've, but I can't. So, which is why I've never done that. So if you want to take yourself up to that level, um, then you will have to, um, find someone that, that can help you with that but you just need to make sure that you'll find you need to find someone with the capability of being able to do that trying to get a teacher that that is going to teach you to that kind of level and do that sort of um mastery of violin is going to be quite difficult so just make sure that you've got someone capable um to teach you that kind of part of it um okay uh we've got just time for one or two more questions let me just SSB 73Q, do you have any recommendations for reasonably priced violin strings? If you have a, a student quality violin, Parastro Tonicas are great strings. I used to recommend Dominance, um, but not anymore. I don't, I last tried some Dominance quite a few years ago and they used to be really good. And I even used to like Dominance on my own violin, but they must have changed something in them because I don't like them anymore and a lot of people have said the same thing but Parastro Tonic is a very very good if you've got a student quality violin $200 $300 something like that they're very good because they will really brighten and liven up the sound so I can 100% recommend Parastro Tonicas for student quality violin if you've got a violin which is kind of excuse me closer to around what the thousand dollar mark thousand pound mark then you might be looking at something more uh something from parastro but maybe something a little bit more synthetic maybe a mixture of synthetic or gut strings you would have to then look into the strings and sort of see how they describe the strings and then how you think your violin sounds and put sort of two and two together and kind of try it out from there but when you get to that kind of level I don't really know because then when you're paying a thousand dollars plus or a thousand pounds plus for a violin then your violin is going to have a particular sound or a particular tone or a particular nuance and as I don't know that then it's hard to match a string to that but a student quality violin will just be a, a student quality violin so you can't really go wrong with parastro tonicas um okay a couple more uh, uh, um uh, just starting vibrato, my teacher says I should create a space between my first and fourth finger, uh, between my first and fourth fingers around the neck. Should I play with that space even at times that I'm not trying to do vibrato? Um, your question is probably best directed at your teacher. I can't see you play, so I don't really want to kind of, uh, I don't want to tread on anyone's toes and kind of interfere because I can't see what you're doing. It would probably be uh, unprofessional of me to comment on that one. So I'm not sure I can help you on that question. Ask your teacher. Your best thing is to ask your teacher. They're teaching you that they'll be able they'll, they'll be able to answer that question for you. Uh, no problem. Um, what else have we got? I think it's just lots of people saying about their mute. I'm buying a practice mute. Yes. <laughs> I use my mute all the time. Neighbours haven't said anything so far. That's great. Um, Amy, one last question. If I can't spread out the little piece on the fine tuner, can I take off the fine tuner? Um, yes, you can. 
yeah, you, you can. The only one I would recommend you not, um, I'm not sure whether you said what string it was, I can't remember. The only one I would recommend you don't take off is the E string. Don't take the E string tuner off. Try and keep the E string tuner, but um, I wonder if I can, I don't know if you can just see, just under here. Can you see the, the little balls there? I think you can just about see that there. So the balls just hook, the balls just go into those holes there. Oh, let's tilt you around that way. The balls go into that hole and you just sort of poke them in. It's very easy to do. The, you just put the ball in, slide it sort of up and then it'll attach itself. So as long as you've got something kind of like that on your your uh, your towel piece, then yes, that's absolutely fine. Um, the Metal Mutes DC um, says, I found the Metal Mutes are the only ones that significantly lower the volume. The large ones... Um, of either rubber or similar don't affect the volume enough for me well no this is what I'm gonna uh, this is what I might do for next week then I might um, see what I can get hold of from Amazon and things like that and I can put a few links in and then we'll just try them together uh, and just go from there but maybe that depends on your violin but it might depend on the the practice mute as well I think there is a brand called the ultra practice mute as opposed to just a practice mute so it might be that you just want to get something with nice thick sturdy rubber uh, all the way, you know, inside and outside, not just kind of hollow and kind of flimsy. So that might make a difference. But uh, let me let me buy a couple of things um, and then we can just try them next week. Um, so I think, uh, let me just see one more question and then we will finish. Uh, Kevmuth, will you have all the links below for violin strings, mutes? Um, I'll have some of the things underneath. Um, I've done videos of these in the past. So I've got links, I've got links to them on previous videos. I'll see what I can add in. Um, Tasman as, says, as well as your course books, what other practice books do you recommend to use? Um, whatever you want to really. My course books are going to teach you everything that you need to know. So the actual tutorial books themselves are going to teach you the skill that you need and the song books that go with them are going to give you the songs that you want to do so you're not going to be bored either way the the tutorial books are going to teach you the technique and give you technique um technique exercises and things like that to practice and then so that you can consolidate that and put that into uh practical ability the song book that comes after that is going to give you the, the the music that you want to be able to play at the same level as the tutorial book that you've just been going through so you don't have to find any other music so you don't have to have any other music. My course is fully comprehensive. It's just, it's uh, an insular course all on its own based on all of my years of teaching. But I mean, there isn't really anything specifically I would recommend that you go and have a look at. Um, as I said, my course is aimed at teaching you the skill you need to go away yourself and uh, be able to play any kind of piece of music you want. But I do have, have a look on my shop. Um, this one here, underneath here, um, www.amsmusicshop.com. Uh, there we go, I'm just behind the microphone there. Have a look on that. Um, and I've got some few other little, I've got a few other little pieces uh, for violin. If you want to have a look up there, uh, same thing, 100% downloadable. So those are always good. Anything I've written to accompany my book calls, they're always good if you want to have a look at those. Um... Jefferson, just started your lessons. It's been helpful so far. What's the best advice um, for a beginner in a sentence? Um, which I think I said it's just covered by something at the end there. Um, best advice? Practice. <laughs> um, practice, practice, really. It's the only thing that you can do. Um, right. I think I've answered everybody's question. Apologies if I haven't. Um, I'm going to stop here. Um, and let everybody enjoy the rest of their day or their evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, ben, you're very welcome. I will just have a quick look through some of the questions now and I'll see if I've missed any. And if I have, I apologise and I will pass them over to next week's live. But other than that, have a good week and I will see you same time next Friday. Thank you all very much for joining me and have a good one. Bye.